Well, I think it's showing that we need to be on the front foot, and this is, I think, what the government is showing, and get the information that's really crucial to management. And at the moment, we need to know where and how much the bleaching is affecting the reef. Now, um, uh, I think this also emphasises the importance of baselines. Um, we went out and did uh, surveys of the Great Barrier Reef across 125 kilometres of territory, north and south. Uh, and that information has turned out to be very important in terms of knowing where we were in 2012 and where we're likely to be by the end of 2016. Unless we had those baselines, we weren't able to really make those assessments. Well, one thing we know about coral bleaching, which is a response to heat stress, is that it's very difficult to prevent it from occurring. It's really a consequence of heat waves, underwater heat waves moving through coral reef areas and causing corals to bleach and die. But what is becoming evident in, in the scientific literature is that if you take the stresses off reefs post bleaching, you can improve the circumstances of the recovery. You can make them, you can help them recover. Th this is a really important issue for Australians. This is one of the world's largest marine parks. It's, suffering from underwater, uh, underwater heat waves uh, which are causing corals to bleach and die. Now those corals uh, are the basis for uh, billion dollar tourist and fishing industries as well as uh, supporting 69,000 people. Um, what we really need to understand here is, is why it's happening, where it's happening and how we respond because if we can reduce those local stresses we can get to a point where we improve the um, the rate at which reefs will recover, and that's really important. This bleaching event has really um, taught us a couple of lessons. One is that um, we are in a time of warming and that these events are becoming more and more frequent. The second thing is that it really has, has uh, been a bit of a wake-up call uh, to all of us in that the northern sector of the reef, which is the healthiest part of the reef, which we thought was perhaps maybe immune, maybe it wasn't going to be affected by climate change, is as vulnerable as any, part of, any other part of the reef. Uh, what we've seen over the past uh, couple of weeks is reefs that are in very good shape because of the fact that we've got um, good coastal forests, we've got mangroves intact along that coastline, and the water quality issues are not as severe as elsewhere, that those reefs are in good shape. But what we've seen is that the effect of climate change on ocean temperature is having direct impacts. And that, of course, is the wake-up call. I think we've got to be careful to realise that um, it's not just the environment that's changing or that the solutions only exist in the area of uh, places like the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we live in a very changing world and that's one of the uh, key focuses of the Global Change Institute at the University of Queensland and that is that um, everything's connected whether it be water, energy, food or oceans. There is a tangled interlocking set of relationships that we need to um, find solutions in and so it's, this is one of the things that we uh, are very passionate about at the University of Queensland. It's about solutions. We cannot take our eye off the impacts because we don't understand them. We don't understand why certain parts of the reef are bleaching more than others in terms of, of temperature stress. We don't know, for example, um, how to integrate uh, those impacts into the broader setting of how we solve problems that benefit people, ecosystems and business. So it's really important that we don't take our eye off the ball and places like the Global Change Institute are becoming more and more important in finding those complex solutions that we need to find if we are to go forward with a Great Barrier Reef that's intact.